Hi everyone! Welcome back to our next Ancient Persia video lecture. Uh, this lecture and the next one are going to deal with the most famous event uh, in the history of the Persian Empire, the one that is described in more detail than any other event. Uh, that is the Persian-Greek Wars, or the invasion of mainland Greece by King Xerxes of Persia uh, in 480 uh, and its aftermath in 479 BCE. This is a famous event because of Herodotus's histories. It's the ultimate subject matter uh, that Herodotus wrote about. It makes up uh, books six, or, or excuse me, books seven, eight, and nine of the histories, one third of Herodotus's work, uh, and no other later event in Achaemenid history, except for the empire's final fall to Alexander the Great, is described by a narrative source in so much detail. Of course, this poses innumerable challenges for historians who seek to recover a Persian point of view. There is no Persian narrative, no Persian source mentions the invasions of Greece. And we are left to try to use what we know about the empire uh, from the earlier records of Darius, uh, from royal inscriptions about the imperial worldview, and from uh, documents like the Persepolis fortification tablets that show us how the empire worked on the ground. Uh, we try to use those to give some context uh, and to try to understand through educated guesswork uh, why the empire uh, acted the way it did, uh, why the military uh, invasion of Greece was a failure, and how the empire uh, reacted and adapted uh, after this event. In uh, the first of these discussions, we're going to try to think about what we know on the background of Xerxes' reign. Uh, what he was trying to achieve, as far as we can tell, uh, in invading Greece, uh, and what this would have meant from an imperial perspective. Uh, so first of all, we, we know Xerxes came to power uh, in 486 BC, uh, after the death of Darius of natural causes, uh, after a 36-year reign. Uh, his son Xerxes, uh, when he succeeded his father, was in his 30s by the time he invaded Greece, in uh, year six of his reign, Xerxes would be about 40 years old. Xerxes' reign is often viewed by modern historians through the lens of Herodotus. Uh, because we have no narrative descriptions of Xerxes' reign after the invasion of Greece, uh, even though uh, he would rule the Persian Empire for 20 years, uh, his reign tends to be boiled down to this one major event. Uh, and of course, that's doing Xerxes a great disservice. Uh, we know very little about the center and eastern parts of the empire uh, and what is happening there uh, during the reign of Xerxes. And we should remember that there are uh, many things going on. There must have been other priorities uh, beyond, besides the Greek campaign. That being said, there is also a tendency among uh, modern historians of Persia to try to push back against Herodotus uh, by saying the invasion of Greece could have mattered that much. It wasn't a great strategic priority that Persia should control uh, territory in Europe across the sea. It didn't affect the integrity of the center of the empire. So really, why do the Greek wars uh, matter at all? Uh, is it possible that they are uh, simply uh, exaggerated in their importance uh, by a chauvinistic Greek historical tradition that, that centers the world uh, around Greece. The problem for that line of reasoning uh, is how one explains the king's decision to go and campaign uh, on the Greek frontier in person and to devote such a long period of time and so many resources uh, to a war uh, at this corner of the Achaemenid Empire. So what do we know about uh, Xerxes and his earlier reign, uh, Xerxes' worldview that might shed some extra light on Persian priorities. Uh, we know Xerxes is an experienced administrator uh, who has a background in other regions of the Persian Empire. One Persepolis tablet out of the thousands that we have mentions Xerxes uh, during the reign of his father. Uh, it dates to uh, 497 BCE uh, and it shows Xerxes during the time the Ionian Revolt is going on in the West uh, Xerxes is in a post as either a satrap or a general in Parthia, uh, that is a territory in northeastern uh, Iran. We don't know how long he stayed there, 
but it suggests that he had some administrative training, uh, some preparation for becoming king, besides simply growing up in the royal court as a son of Darius. We know from one of Xerxes' own inscriptions uh, and from Herodotus that he was not the oldest son of Darius. Uh, we know he's the son of uh, Darius and Atasa, the daughter of Cyrus. Uh, his brothers from Darius's first marriage are older than him, uh, yet Xerxes is selected above them for the throne. Uh, some of that selection process may be based on merit and experience, although uh, Herodotus suggests it's because he's the first son born after Darius becomes king. Uh, the maternity of Atasa and the connection through her to Cyrus may also have been significant. And according to Xerxes, who follows uh, his father's uh, inscriptions very closely in, in uh, form and detail, he is also chosen by the favor of Ahura Mazda. Uh, just as his father had, Xerxes is going to link his rise to power with the special selection uh, by uh, a patron god of the royal family. Now, Xerxes' inscriptions are short. We have nothing to rival the Bisatun inscription uh, in detail. But the one inscription of Xerxes that is most important, uh, that gets uh, most attention uh, and debate from scholars, uh, is the Xerxes Persepolis H inscription. Uh, otherwise known as the Daiwa inscription. Uh, and I hope that you'll read that closely uh, in the readings on Scholar. The Daiwa inscription is brief. Uh, it's found on a, a, a single tablet uh, at Persepolis uh, in uh, the languages of the empire. We have it in Old Persian, Elamite, uh, and Babylonian. Uh, the Daiwa inscription uh, is an interesting text because it talks about Xerxes' role in the world, uh, but it does so uh, in a uh, broadly vague uh, and generalizing format. It begins with Xerxes' uh, invocation of Ahura Mazda. Uh, you get the divine creation narrative. You get the royal titles uh, and a list of lands that Xerxes ruled uh, when he became king. Uh, these include the Greeks, and the Greeks across the sea. But then we have some interesting statements. Uh, it states that when I became king, there was one among the peoples that I ruled that was in turmoil. Uh, and I smote that people, I put it back in its place. I, I restored order. The question, of course, is which one? Uh, is he referring to a specific event here? The language is deliberately nonspecific, uh, is deliberately vague. His restoration of order uh, has been associated by some scholars uh, with uh, guesses uh, about a, a connection to revolts in certain countries or maybe even the Greek campaign. But more recent scholarship tends to reject that search for a, a hidden event uh, underlying this and suggests instead that this is a programmatic statement. Uh, a suggestion that wherever there's trouble, King Xerxes is going to put things to right. More detailed uh, and yet maddeningly uh, nonspecific is the statement about the Daiwas. Uh, Daiwa in Old Persian uh, is cognate with daimon, is cognate with daimon or, or demon uh, or a form of... Uh, spiritual being uh, in Greek thought. Uh, the Daiwas are, are sometimes associated by scholars of Zoroastrianism uh, with evil spirits that serve Ariman uh, and try to uh, spread chaos and uh, the lie in the world. So Xerxes suggests that somewhere in his lands there was a place where Daiwas were worshipped. He put down this false worship uh, and instead, he worshipped Ahura Mazda uh, properly uh, in this place where Daiwas had once been worshipped. Uh, and again, we don't know what he's talking about here. It, it sounds as if there may be some event uh, that he has in mind, but we don't have any other details. We don't have a date. 
we can't connect this to a specific moment of religious reform in some specific uh, part of the empire. Uh, again, recent scholarship tends to take this as a, a broad programmatic statement of piety by the king. Uh, it certainly expands on references by Darius to Ahura Mazda as the ultimate guardian of truth uh, and the king above all others, uh, the god above all others whom the king of Persia should worship. Uh, but how this translates to specific practice on the ground uh, remains deeply unclear. Again, we do not have a date for the Daiwa uh, inscription. Um, the references to a number of different factors might suggest that it's not issued at the very beginning of Xerxes' reign. Perhaps it postdates the Greek campaign, uh, but here we're really only guessing. In any case, this inscription certainly follows up on and expands on Darius's ideas uh, about the king as a ruler of the world, a guarantor of universal order, uh, someone who claims to bring peace through interventionist action uh, where there is trouble, uh, and someone who associates a Caymanid order in the universe uh, with the special relationship uh, between the king uh, and a god that oversees the empire. So turning from this to dated events, uh, we know about a few things that happen early in Xerxes' reign. Uh, we know from Herodotus and some Egyptian records that the first major uh, task of the king is to put down a revolt in Egypt. Uh, where a would-be pharaoh has come to power and gained recognition in, in some parts uh, of the country. Xerxes seems to have gone to Egypt in person in the first year of his reign uh, in order to put down this rebellion. Um, in some parts of Egypt, uh, it may have lasted well into 485 uh, before it is finally suppressed. Now, after the Egyptian campaign, Xerxes seems to have returned to the center of his empire, but we know from Babylonian business records that in 484, Xerxes year two, uh, there are two would-be Babylonian kings that rise up simultaneously, maybe fighting each other as well as the Persians uh, in uh, different regions of Babylonia. Uh, they last for a few months uh, after the initial references uh, to the two of them in dating formulas of Babylonian documents, one disappears. Uh, you see only one of these rulers recognized at multiple Babylonian sites, uh, and then he disappears. Uh, and as we mentioned before our uh, spring break, the Babylonian archives of the major temples uh, and most of the major business families in northern Babylonia suddenly stop uh, by the end of the year 484. Uh, so we believe that uh, Xerxes is able to restore order. There's no evidence that he campaigned there in person. Uh, he may have delegated uh, Babylonian operations to uh, one or more of his generals, uh, as is suggested by a late Greek source, the uh, fragments of Ctesias's Persica. Uh, Herodotus uh, claims that at one point uh, Xerxes had, had killed uh, Babylonian priests and looted uh, Babylonian temples, uh, but many modern scholars have questioned the historical value uh, of this report. Uh, and we really don't know any details of how the Persians restored order uh, in Babylonia. However, uh, it's likely that these sorts of early events, putting down revolts in other provinces, uh, set up Xerxes uh, as a powerful, successful king by the time he turns to Greece. Uh, by the time year six of his reign rolls around and Xerxes launches the Greek campaign, he has already been successful uh, in retaking these key regions of empire, uh, Egypt and Babylon. Uh, the move to the Greek campaign is interesting because the king is now going to move out again from the center of the empire uh, to its northwestern corner. You remember that Darius had campaigned uh, at the four corners of the Achaemenid universe uh, after his initial success in the Bissetun campaign. We may see something somewhat similar going on. Xerxes has campaigned in Egypt, in the far southwest corner of the empire. Now in year six, uh, he is going to move out uh, to Sardis and then across the sea 
uh, to Trans Aegean Greece in the far northwestern corner. Uh, in that sense, he's continuing uh, Darius's uh, campaign pattern uh, of moving from the center out to the edges uh, and thus showing that he is a universal ruler, uh, that he controls the entirety uh, of the, the Achaemenid world. Now Herodotus uh, gives us a number of uh, possible explanations in the beginning of Book 7 uh, for uh, multiple motives for the Persian invasions of Greece. Uh, many of these are, are perfectly plausible. Uh, Herodotus recognizes Xerxes' wish to compete with Darius's legacy and memory uh, and go farther, and do something in addition to what his father had done to set up his own legitimacy as king. Uh, Herodotus also suggests that there is a delayed Persian revenge against Athens for the Battle of Marathon uh, and the failure of the first Persian attack on overseas Greece. Again, this can be a continuation of what Darius had done, or Darius had sent generals to Greece who failed. Uh, Xerxes uh, here can build on his tradition by going in person. We know that Ionian Greeks uh, under direct Persian rule are, are heavily involved in the Persian invasion force. Uh, they make up a significant part of Xerxes' navy in the invasion of Greece across the sea. Uh, and again, I would suggest that the invasion of Greece uh, moving out beyond the frontier and using Greeks uh, in the Persian invasion force is a way of cementing the loyalty uh, of those Ionian Greeks within the empire. Finally, Herodotus emphasizes the presence of Greek exiles at the Persian court. The family of the late tyrant of Athens, Hippias, and a former king of Sparta, Demaratus, who had been exiled from Sparta in 491. Uh, and who had come to the Persian court. Uh, these exiles are, are asking Persia for restoration. Uh, and it's possible, although Herodotus suggests that Demaratus is sort of a warning figure who, who tells Xerxes truths about the Greeks that Xerxes can't accept, uh, it's possible that uh, some of these exiles are, are assuring the Persians uh, of support by the right kind of Greeks uh, when they cross the sea and try to show off their influence in the Greek city-states. Uh, as we look at the beginning of uh, Xerxes' campaign, there are a few factors that I would suggest are, are uh, really significant. Uh, first of all, the king is going to be away from the center of the empire for a long time. Uh, and this suggests that uh, a great deal of importance is placed uh, on uh, the Persian invasion of Greece. To lead the campaign in person, instead of just communicating by messenger and sending generals to do the job. Uh, Xerxes has to leave the center of his empire about halfway through the fifth year of his reign, uh, 481 BCE. We know that the logistical planning, including uh, the digging of a canal through the Athos Peninsula, uh, the building of a bridge over the Strymon River in Thrace, and the building of pontoon bridges across the Hellespont to allow the army crossing, uh, this total process, uh, plus the stockpiling of food in Thrace uh, to support the Persian advance, takes about uh, two and a half or three years before Xerxes' army actually moves out from Sardis. Xerxes gets to Sardis in the winter of uh, 481 to 480. He leaves Sardis in April of 480. Uh, he moves about 15 or 1600 miles from Susa to Sardis. And then in 480, in the invasion, he covers another 800 miles from Sardis to Athens. Uh, finally, he'll return from Athens back to Sardis uh, in the winter of 480 to 479. Uh, he'll then stay in Sardis through much of 479 uh, before he returns to the center of the empire uh, in the later part of his seventh year. All in all, there are almost three years of the king's reign devoted to this progress uh, and military expedition and all of the supporting details uh, on the northwestern frontier. So we have to ask, you know, why did Xerxes go in person? Uh, and again, it suggests that he associated this expedition with a great spectacle uh, of royal prestige, uh, a display of the empire's power and of his own association uh, with its most ambitious military projects. Now, Herodotus famously gives us uh, numbers, 
specific, although wildly exaggerated numbers for the size of the Persian invasion army uh, and fleet. Uh, there have been countless modern efforts uh, to come up with more realistic estimates uh, for what could be supported uh, in the land army and the navy uh, by logistical stockpiles. Uh, it's clear that Herodotus figures of 1.7 million soldiers on land, uh, of 1,207 trireme warships, each with a crew of 200, uh, are unsustainable uh, in an actual military setting. Um, modern estimates uh, that are, take proper account of the logistical problems often reduce Xerxes' land army uh, to less than 100,000 or less than 75,000 uh, combat soldiers. Uh, certainly many of the ethnic contingents that Xerxes' army supposedly includes uh, in its initial muster uh, are then never mentioned again in Herodotus. Uh, Pierre Briant draws a distinction between a parade army uh, that may have mustered at the beginning of the campaign as a display of imperial power with contingents from every single province of empire and then a more functional campaign army that might have been restricted to a smaller number uh, of especially ethnic Iranian contingents. Uh, it's clear, clear that the core of the invasion force was made up uh, of the so-called immortals mentioned by Herodotus, which again may be uh, a standing army uh, made up of uh, forces kept usually at the imperial center and, and maybe some of the garrisons uh, from satrapal centers uh, in the outer provinces. The navy uh, is more likely to have contained something like 600 warships uh, with full crews uh, as opposed to 1,200. Uh, 1,200 is, uh, again, a figure that's so high uh, it would produce uh, a, a vast number of men who would be extraordinarily difficult to feed. Uh, so ultimately, we can't know the exact number. Uh, we know the Persians outnumber the coalition Greek forces of Athens and Sparta that they fight against, uh, but they do not outnumber them by such a vast degree uh, that they can simply swamp them uh, with human waves. It's clear that as the actual invasion uh, goes forward, Xerxes takes every opportunity to set up spectacles and rituals of imperial power. Uh, but there is genuine uh, fighting. Uh, there's genuine difficulty for the Persian invasion force with storms uh, that strike their fleet uh, along the coast of the Greek mainland. Uh, and these will have inflicted some casualties, uh, if probably not on the wild scale uh, that Herodotus describes. The invasion uh, sets out from Sardis, probably in April or early May uh, of 480. Uh, it pauses to regroup in Macedonia, in northern Greece. In Macedonia, in northern Greece, uh, in the high summer of 480. Uh, and then it fights key battles offshore at Cape Artemisium and on land at the Thermopylae Pass in August of 480. Herodotus describes the heroic defense of the Greeks, uh, especially the stand of the Spartans and King Leonidas at the Thermopylae Pass. But it must not obscure the fact uh, that these were major military victories for the Persian side. Uh, for all that Herodotus suggests Thermopylae was won uh, by treachery, uh, by local Greeks uh, who betrayed the Spartans and their defenders, uh, there are reasons to consider this problematic as there is no united country of Greece, uh, and the Spartans uh, and many of their allies are invading central Greece, uh, just as the much larger Persian force is. What's clear is that the Persians figure out how to gather intelligence. They figure out how to move uh, large numbers of soldiers uh, over the mountains in the middle of the night in order to outflank uh, the Greek defending army. And their victory at Thermopylae uh, is crucial because it makes Athens uh, indefensible by land. So Xerxes marches into Athens uh, in uh, early September of 480. Uh, he captures the city. In some ways, uh, it's clear that the Persians 
uh, may have viewed this as the, the high point of the campaign. Uh, Xer Xerxes, according to Herodotus, uh, after the Battle of Salamis, when his fleet is defeated at sea, uh, is reassured by advisors who tell him, you've captured Athens. This was a show of force. Uh, this is a display of imperial power. You've taken and burned uh, a center of resistance to the empire in overseas Greece. Uh, some scholars believe that this is what Xerxes can call a, his mission accomplished moment. Uh, Athens has fallen. He has marched from the center of the empire to the edge of the world. Uh, and he can go back again. But it is an incomplete campaign because he has not succeeded in, in breaking up Greek military resistance to the empire. Uh, and instead, the Greek military uh, resistance continues with the Spartans in the Peloponnese and with uh, the victory of the Greek fleet uh, off Athens shores at Salamis. Uh, and that is going to complicate the effort uh, to show this as a, a display of worldwide imperial power.